and then you are going to vent the chamber. Don't rely on the progress bar down here for venting. The time it takes for it to turn green, it, the chamber will actually have been vented for quite a while. The next step is to mount your sample. Now the height of your sample is very, very important. The pole piece, which I mentioned previously in a few minutes ago, you do not want to hit. It's very easy to damage and very expensive to replace. So what's very important is that whatever sample you put in here, you are always going to want to measure the height of the sample using the height measure and make sure that you are underneath that projection. So you are going to take your sample, put it, of course, using the pin stubs as we discussed, put it in the hole, and then you are going to measure the height of your sample. All right, so as you can see here, the sample is way below that four mark. The four mark is actually very important because four millimeters is the operating height that you are gonna be want to work at. So, and what that mark represents is at the top of your sample, is below that four mark, the stage will not be able to rise high enough to allow you to get to that operating height. So what I need to do is I need to raise the sample holder up. To do that, it's actually a multi-step process. I'm gonna temporarily remove the sample. And then there's actually three parts in the sample holder. There is this center crosshair, cross section which is what actually screws in and out of the stage. The bottom part, what I call the retaining ring, is not actually physically into the stage. Instead, it actually has two parts that actually screw into each other. And that basically is going to adjust the height. So what's going to happen is you are going to set the height with the center one and then use the retaining ring to push up against it and lock it into place. So in this case, I know it needed to go up higher, so I've increased the space between the top part and the bottom. I'm going to put the cross piece in, tighten it back down, see, nice and tight. And now I can put the sample back in and measure my height. And I am above the four mark, but below the max. And this is where I want the top of my sample to be. So now all I have to do is take the torque wrench, find where the set screw is right here, tighten it down until the torque wrench clicks. And now not only is the sample holder nice and solid, but so is the sample itself. Because you've already measured the height, you, you are safe to close the door. Give it just a little bit of pressure and hit pump. Once you have the sample in place on the stage, next step is going to be to come up here to pump. The system will check its default positioning. Then it will go to the nav cam photo position. And you will see an update over here in the nav cam view. And it comes back to where it was initially loaded. So as you can see down here with the green bar, it is currently pumping down. What we are going to wait for before proceeding is over here in the lower left-hand corner, you see where it says chamber pressure. We are going to wait for this to read 5.0 to the negative five millibar. This will usually take somewhere in the vicinity of uh, three to five minutes, though if it's particularly humid out or if someone's left the chamber door open for a while, it can take substantially longer than that. The vacuum gauge will activate at approximately around uh, two to the negative four millibar, and that's when you'll actually start getting a reading down here. If after five or six minutes, the 
chamber pressure here still has not given you a readout and the uh, pump stops uh, basically and gives you a little message saying it has timed out. Check to make sure that you have properly closed the door, that you've put some pressure on it before you pushed pump. Make sure that you have a proper seal. If you do that and it still won't pump down, then feel free to contact staff and tell them that there is a vacuum issue. Often it's something minor, but every so often it can be something that uh, needs staff to figure out. So this is a quick user guide. The goal here is for those of you watching to be able to get a sample in, get some imaging done, and get done minimal musts or fuss. I will not be going into depth on the bells and whistles of this particular microscope. That is going to be a different video. Here you can see, actually, we're almost down to under the five. Now we are beneath the five, the negative five millibar mark, so we are free to start. You'll notice there are four windows here. You can tell which window is active because the data bar at the bottom, such as right here in the nav cam view, is blue. So whichever window you click in, the data bar will become blue, and that is the active window. So first thing I want to do is I want to be able to get an SEM image. So I come over here under the beam controls tab, beam controls, and I'm going to turn the beam on. This green line here should always be green, basically telling you that the FIG module is active. So you'll notice the beam on is now yellow, but still nothing is going on in the window. And that is because of the pause icon up here in the corner. Most people either undo this pause icon either by clicking on the icon itself or clicking on the acquisition button up here in the top bar. So here we have an image, not real sure where we are, but if we look down here the nav cam though, it will give us an indication of where we're at. And so we can easily use this to skip around and find the specific spot that we are looking for. So right now my image is way too dark. It's very blurry. I have no idea what this is. So first things first, let's make this a little bit brighter. This involves the contrast and brightness. Main ways to do that are through the MUI knobs or through the auto contrast and brightness. So now it's a little bit brighter. We can see that there are something there. So what I want to do is I'd like to navigate to, looks like there's a crosshair or something here. I'd like to navigate that into the center. Moving around quite quickly, the main ways to do that is if you use the mouse and you uh, double left click, Wherever you double left click will become the center of the image. Another way to move around, of course, is that you can click and hold the wheel on the mouse button and the arrow points the direction you're gonna go. The further the arrow is from the dot, the faster you go. And this is probably the easiest way to make uh, small movements. If you want to make large movements, probably your best bet is to come back down here to the nav cam view and use this to move around. Now we have an image. It's a very poor image. So what I'm going to do is zoom in. Several ways of zooming in. The primary ways, again, the MUI knobs. That big one is the magnification knob. You can see it moves us in and out. Another way of doing it, though, is that you can come up here to the magnification bar at the top click, you can choose a particular value, or what's more common is to just put in a value here, and that will take you to that particular magnification level. There's something there, still can't make out what it is, now it is time to focus. To do that, you can simply right-click, it'll give you a double-headed arrow, and you can use that to change your focus. Another way you can do it is if you go to the MUI knobs, there's a course and find focus knobs, and you can rotate them to bring it into focus. I'll zoom in a little bit further here now that I can actually see what we're looking at. Uh, another way of focusing is up along the top bar here, you'll find what's called flash. This is actually a very useful 
uh, tool because this does not just the focusing, but as you can see, it also takes care of lens alignment and stigmation for you. Now, one of the things that's important to note about the flash is that it works off of sample with well-defined edges, flash works quite well. If instead the edges are quite diffuse, you know, if you're looking at something that's just got a very smooth pattern to it, uh, it may not actually work well. So it actually didn't do all that beautiful a job on focusing in this case. So if I do this, you'll notice there's stretching going on. This is indicative of stigmation. Now, normally the flash would take care of stigmation for us, but again, in this particular case, the algorithm didn't work real well. So we're going to go to the MUI knobs. You have stigmation X and stigmation Y, and we're going to see if we can't get this a little bit sharper. And you can see having the proper stigmation can make a big difference in the quality of your imaging. You can see how much sharper the edges are on this than they were just a little bit ago. So now we've got an image, but we are not at the proper operating height. If we want to use the ion beam, if we want to use the EDS, we need to be up at the proper operating height, which on this instrument is four millimeters. And if you ever forget what that measurement is, if you look over here in the CCD camera view, uh, you will see that there's a little line and it says four millimeters. So this gives you a uh, visual graphic as to where you should be stopping. But if we come over here to the navigation window, you will note, talks about Z, it says 0005, and it's got a red arrow, and red arrows, red in general, is usually a bad thing. And in this case, what it is, is that the reference position for the stage is actually the main platter down here, because the system itself has no way of knowing how tall you've made the uh, sample holder or how tall your sample is. So, you know, this could be all the way, you know, that's almost down on the platter. It could be sticking up almost about to hit the pole piece. It really doesn't know based off the, the simple geometry of the system. But that having been said, the electron beam does know exactly where the top of the sample is, is long as you're properly focused on the surface of your sample. And the reason for that is because right here you have what's called the working distance, which is basically the distance from that pole piece, which as I mentioned, you do not want to hit, and wherever you are focused, in this case, the top of our sample. So what we are going to do is we are going to link this Z value to this focused working distance. And that button is right here. So when I click that, you will notice that my Z, the red arrow is gone, now replaced by a gray arrow pointing downwards and the measurement more or less matches up with the working distance. So now what I can do is I can put in my appropriate operating height, four millimeters. I can say enter, and I'm going to rest my finger on the escape key just in case it looks like I'm about to hit something. Shouldn't have to, but it's always a good idea. And you'll notice as I did that, my contrast changed heavily in my SEM view. I can't see anything now. So again, I can either go to my brightness and contrast MUI knobs or just take the shortcut, hit the auto contrast, and there we go. Now, one thing to note is the fact that the image doesn't look quite as sharp as it did before. And the reason for that is because the stage went to what it thinks is four millimeters. The electron beam went to exactly four millimeters and the two weren't quite the same. So after you do this first movement, what you are gonna to have to do is you're going to have to refocus, relink, and you'll notice over here that instead of 4.0, it went to 4.1475. And we just put in four again. And now we are at operating height. We can do our imaging, we can do EDS, we can tilt and do ion beam work, whatever is necessary. Once you have finished your imaging or your ion beam work, your EDS work or what have you, shutdown is quite simple. All you need to do is come back up here to beam controls 
you are going to turn the beams off. If you've just used the electron beam, if you've used the ion beam, you are instead going to go to sleep because the sleep will actually turn the ion beam off. And then you are going to vent the chamber. As I mentioned before, don't rely on the progress bar down here for venting. It's going to be, the time it takes for it to turn green, it, the chamber will actually have been vented for quite a while. Move your sample, close up the system, hit pump. And remember, you are not free quite yet. You must remember to also log out of iLab, fill out the logbook, and then you can leave. <laughs>